Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. I've preached on this exact passage, but today is gonna be totally different. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter, you know it, Mike, Peter, James, and John. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, otherwise known as the sons of thunder, not James, the half-brother of Jesus. Peter, James, and John's the three he took up on the mount to show him his glory, the Mount of Transfiguration, those three. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. After church, go YouTube the Garden of Gethsemane so you can see what it looks like. This will resonate different. There's videos and everything. It's super cool. It's much bigger than I imagined. It's quite large. It's like a giant courtyard full of trees. That's where this took place. Verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell asleep. He fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for just an hour? He asked Peter. Figures Peter is the first one to pass out. Watch and pray. Everybody say, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's pretty good talking there, Jesus. It's like he knows something we don't. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because they were up too late the night before and their eyes were heavy and they were extra crabby. No, that was my kids. They, they, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, the Bible says. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here come my betrayer, Judas. My subject today of week three of Jesus' sheep is Jesus' sheep sleep. Jesus' sheep sleep. Doesn't it seem like your worst seasons are the ones you got caught off guard by, came out of nowhere? When we don't know that an attack is brewing, I'll say it like that. What you see when it happens is the fruit of what was already brewing maybe for a long time and we didn't catch it because we were sleeping. That's when we become vulnerable to the enemy. Jesus continually told the apostles to stay and watch as they struggled to stay awake and fell asleep multiple times during Christ's last hour before captivity. That's like me at nine o'clock at night, especially on Sundays. I fall asleep on Sundays thinking about how church went that day, and I wake up on Monday going, what just happened? Where am I? Oh, yeah, it's Monday. It's this this really weird ebb and flow of church and the week, and that's just my weirdness. And then it starts over, and then by Monday afternoon, I'm recharged again, Mike. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And then another Sunday comes, and that's been seven years almost just like that. Will you be alert and ready? Everybody say ready. When circumstance strikes and have your armor of faith up, or will you be like sheep sleeping amongst the presence of wolves? Don't sleep through it. Don't sleep through it. I'll never forget, Mike. Mike, it's just me and you today, buddy. I don't know why. You know why I'm so excited to see you? Because I thought y'all were still at the beach. And I saw y'all back there. I'm like, praise God, they came to church after being at the beautiful Gulf, Gulf Beach. Welcome back. Glad you're back safely. Um, the first year we started this church, there was the very first family that came. And we were like so excited because they weren't related to us. And then they came back. I'm like, dear Lord, maybe this really is God doing something. Because, you know, I didn't know. 
We just, we just step out on the water and see what happens, you know. We, we never planted a church, but we've been part of enough to know that we probably had an idea how to do it. And then we learned a bunch. And, and the dad of this family would come up on the front row, and in the first 10 seconds, I'd see his face light up with his phone, and then he'd slowly check out. He'd check out before we even started this thing. And that used to annoy the heck out of me, Ben, because I'm like, can you just not sit in front of me and do that? Can you sit in the back? And I got over it, but it was funny because he was immediately just sleeping to what was being said. Now, the irony of that guy, he ended up leaving because he got offended at something I'm a guest speaker of mine said once, and he remembered that, but he forgets the other year they were with us of sermons that were preaching goodness into his heart. And, and it was weird, but we sleep all the time, and that's normal, but when and where matters. Sheep must sleep. You got to sleep. How many went to sleep last night? That's good. What happens if you don't go to sleep in a reasonable time and you just keep trying to stay awake? Eventually what happens? Your eyes stay stuck open and you're sleeping with your eyes open like some of my kids used to do. They'd pass out, and you'd, you'd take their little eye, look, and you see the creepy eyes, you know, and they were sleeping, but they were like, eyes were kind of part open when they're, anyway, TMI. This text is normally preached a different way. This text is normally about Jesus and what he went through. Vince, you remember this passage from the YMCA, the Garden of Gethsemane? You said that touched you, and I remember us talking about that, and this passage is all about Jesus taking on the weight of the world because that moment he felt everything the world had ever done, and he wept. And people get confused thinking he was weak. He wasn't weak. He was human. He wept because the moment before he, went, he knew he was about to be betrayed, he felt the weight of the world. Every murder, every rapist, every drug dealer, every, every sin that could be committed, Jesus felt in that moment, and he now knew, okay, I'm feeling the pressure, God. <laughs> This is heavy. This is Jesus talking, and he's still starting to go, if it's really your will, then I'll do it. But if it's not your will, I'm okay with just being a carpenter at this point. And that's the, that's the, that's the funny part is because he was God in the flesh. So, so the spirit knew, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, he says, because the humanity part of him was still human. You getting this? I hate to break it to you, but everyone in this room is a human. And the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so normally this is preached all about Jesus getting annoyed because they couldn't uphold just this little bit of um, dedication to the cause when Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross any moment and be captured any moment. And there was this one verse that bothered me in this passage. I kept reading it going, that has nothing to do with what I've preached this about. Why is that in there? And God said, yeah, that's because that's for today. We get caught up, and this is very important that you get the revelation of what happened to Christ in this garden this night and the weight he felt. But he was not irritated at them because he needed them to stay awake for him. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. God is so good. I'm not going to jump there yet. He's always looking out for you way before the attack comes. This is not about the garden. Peter, give me a sword, God. I'll just cut the ear off when he comes. You're missing it, Peter, James, John, all of y'all. You can't even stay awake. It's not about sleep. That's inevitable. We all need rest. But the apostles were unaware because they were sleeping at the wrong time. This was a tutorial Jesus was giving. How many know what a tutorial is? You go online, you learn how to do it. Jesus is giving them a tutorial of what is to come. And if you can't even stay awake for an hour, if you can't walk with the footmen, you're not going to run with no soldiers of what is to come. They were unaware. They were just tired. Our ability to sleep through things that are destroying us is the world we live in today. Let's 
just keep scrolling. Just keep scrolling. I'm sad. I fall asleep to P. Diddy. Garbage. I don't need that. You know how it suggests more of the same thing? And then you, all of a sudden you're getting flooded by this junk. And you fall asleep to it. How many have dreams or nightmares or both? You know, what you let in is what's circling in the, in the dome when you're sleeping. And so there's danger there. Sleeping amongst the wrong atmosphere impressions. The, ser- the scenario that is shown here is not tiredness, it's discernment, lack of discernment. We're not talking about being tired, we're talking about lack of discernment. Whew, just straight over the head. Sometimes I'll say something at home, and I'll say, Michelle, this is so good, blah, 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 and she'll go, no one will understand that, that's too deep. And I thought, that's why everybody gave me deer and headlights in my house. Okay, how do I bring it up to surface level? God, this is not about being tired. It's about discernment. Jesus is preparing them for something. And they're not discerning even the simplicity of this command to stay awake for an hour while I go and pray. Just one hour. They couldn't do it. Do we know what to choose at the right time as they didn't, when and where? The mission was to pray, watch, and be on guard, but the flesh overruled them. They were heavy. Don't sleep through it. One time, we took a trip. We took a few. The very first family trip we took was May 2014. My little buddy's 13 now, turning three. And uh, we went to Destin, Florida. How many have been there? Anybody been to Destin? Anybody been to Florida? Anybody heard of Florida? Anybody know what St. Louis is? Okay. Wherever we got to land, we'll land there. And we drove all night, like Need to Breathe song, great song. And that's back when I was more impatient and didn't get a hotel overnight because I thought, why, why would you do that? We need to get there now. I didn't think about the consequence of my mind being shattered from not sleeping for the entire drive overnight. And it's funny. I don't know if you've ever driven overnight in, in Alabama where there's, they don't believe in stop uh, street lights or anything. At nighttime, you just see the little dashes on the road. And as, every once in a while, semi goes by. When you do this hour on end and there's no other lights, after a while, you start going, did I fall asleep? Was I awake? I don't really know. And that happened about 3 a.m. when all the espresso shops closed on the way down. It was working good, Debbie, until Starbucks was totally out of commission because they didn't exist to where we were. The only thing that existed where we were were chainsaws and, and, and people with masks. And, and so we were going, right? And I'm like, I, I, I said, Michelle, I think, I think I need to pull over. Like, I don't know if I passed out. I don't even remember if I was sleeping while I was driving the car. It scared the heck out of me. Can we say heck? Scared the Hades out of me. And uh, that's biblical. And um, so I'm like, well, we're going to pull over. It's pitch black everywhere we go here, right? And we couldn't even find a gas station. All I could find is like, you know, axe murder uh, territory. And so finally, the dawn, like it was almost, almost daybreak, right? And there's a gas station and we pull up in this gas station. It's still, it's still pitch dark out, but there's the gas station lights. And so I pull in the gas station. I'm like, okay, I got to pull in in a way that is safe because I can't take my family on their first trip, pull in this gas station and go to sleep, and we all get annihilated by some crazy because uh, it's sketchy over here where we're at. At least we thought. So I parked with my mirror is at the widest angle of the entire parking lot that I could, and there was a light, and I remember, I said, if I could get 20 minutes, I'm good the rest of the trip, and I remember my, (laughs) I remember keeping my eye like this, sleeping in my truck, watching that mirror, just, just enough that I could get like 80% of the sleep, but if anybody's going to attack my family, you know, I could whip out the ninja and jump out and kill everybody and protect my children, right, my three-year-old, 
Well, just as that was taking place, I look at the back and it's pitch black. You got a three-year-old, a four-year-old. This is pre-Kaylee. We only had three kids back then. Now we have like 27. It was, it was Chloe, who was four, Caleb, who was three, and Colton was one and just screamed a lot, kind of like now. And um, I look back there and I see Caleb's face is boom, light up with his tablet in the pitch black. Like, you know, when you're three, the tablet's like as big as you. And so he had this tablet, and I just, I remember being so scared, and then I start laughing like at three in the morning because I see my son's face light up. He was good. He's just sitting there rolling with the punches all night long as long as he had his tablet. But that's funny and all, and, and from then on, we started putting a hotel in the middle of the trip so it wasn't an all-nighter because we actually felt better the next day. But I never took my guard down because it just takes one little slither for the snake to get in. It just takes one little crack to get in and take over when you're not awake. I could have really done a one and we got on the, on the parking lot, got some sleeping bags, just said, oh, Jesus will protect us, lay on the pavement. That would have not been wise. Even Jesus here is saying, be alert, you know, be wise. So to me, when people say God will protect me, God says use common sense too. He's telling them right there, use common sense. God protects you through common sense. That's the legs on prayers. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It lands in front of you through discernment. And they didn't have it. Don't turn your back, but keep one eye open in the garden. So all that to say, wisdom knows when to rest and when not. And this is what jumped out at me. Let's look at verse 41 again, Colton. This troubled me, actually, because I didn't understand the second half. He said, watch and praise, or the, the second half of it. Watch and pray so you not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why? I kept saying, why is he telling them not to be tempted? Tempted for what? To quit. What they didn't know is that this was preparation for when he is not with them. And that if they can't even stay awake for an hour, when he leaves and they remember the commitment that they made to him, the spirit is willing, but let me tell you, the flesh is weak. It's real easy to get selfish when you start feeling that pressure. You can really talk yourself into a lot of selfish things and say, it's just easier, why not? He's saying, you better stay awake. I asked you three times, because if you can't stay awake, when the fight comes down the road in 2024, you better be watching because you're going to be sleeping. This has nothing to do with letting Jesus down in the garden. You see that? This is him being so good, so much of a good shepherd, that he's saying your future is going to bring the test that you're going to want to quit. You're going to want to move on. And you're going to have every reason why it's okay. But is it? If this cup not be your will, but my, not my will, but your will, let it pass from me. And then we start saying, I think it's his cup. We change what the cup looks like. Even Jesus kind of, you know, I don't know, is this cup, I don't know if I can bear this, God, if it's your will. Well, I know what I do. I say, well, maybe his will looks like this. There, it's your will, God. Yet I've prayed since I was a teenager, not my will, but your will be done here on earth, Lord. Let it not be my will, God. And then I question, I think that's my will, God. What was yours again? He says, keep your eye open. Don't be sleeping. Isn't it so good that this is all about them in their future and how to handle it? Because think about it. Jesus gets betrayed, and he knows it. Why does he need them to stay awake? He's going to stop them from protection. Remember that Peter tried to cut the ear? He don't need you to, to cut the ear and stop the betrayal. That's inevitable. That's the will of God. So that tells me in verse 41, it has nothing to do with the garden. It has nothing to do with his captivity. It has to do with your future as a disciple. There will be a moment when you decide, I don't know if this is for me. I'm tempted. 
My spirit is strong, but my flesh is weak. Eat something. Get some iron. Get some carbs. Get your flesh back in alignment with your spirit. You remember what that felt like? Sometimes. This represents the battle of quitting on Jesus. The enemy will tell you everything you need to know to get you to walk away from Jesus and his church, from Jesus and his mission, because whatever he can feed your mind to get you to fall to temptation, he wins. He'll make you really confused. He'll make you start doubting. Call it the plan of God. I guess it just wasn't God's will. You see how we do that? If it was meant to be, it would happen. Oh, I used to hate that statement. Well, what determines that when people would say that? If it was meant to be, it'll happen. Okay, what does that mean? You're telling me the fruit of my labor, nothing I put into anything I ever do matters because if it's meant to be, it'll happen? No, God gave me a brain. God gave me discernment. God gave me some knowledge, some wisdom, and leaning on him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means something. Therefore, that means my investment matters to it. My investment to the cause matters to this. I may come in warming the seats, but I may leave raising the sword. I was walking around my house the other day. How many walk around their house? It's a joke. It's silly, I know. And I think I'm turning into my father because I said, I've been carrying this sword and I never pull it off the belt, Mike. God says, you got to teach on the power of the sword is in the ability of the person who's using it. The sword has no power unless you draw the weapon, unless you put on your armor. I thought, man, that's good. I need to write a sermon on that. Because I realize I've been carrying their armor sometimes, but I don't use nothing. So I just get beat up. The sword is only as powerful as the person who holds it to use and skillfully you get this? That's just a little trailer for sermons to come. The power of the sword. When you forget the power that's in you, that's strapped to your waist in your heart, you will want to quit what you're facing. I watch these stories online of the most faithful people of God that fall to the flesh. And I'm like, why does this happen? It's because something happens in their mind that they forget what they're holding. They forget what they're carrying. The fatigue is so great, they lose all discernment. The enemy wants to tire you out. He wants you to take a nap at the wrong time. You need to sleep, the enemy says. Go to sleep. It's okay. Be careful when, be careful where. Jesus scolded them, not for him. Jesus don't have an ego. How dare you fall asleep? I am the Lord. No, I love you so much that you don't see, just like all the other things yet, what I'm trying to show you for later. This is what's going to protect you. It was about their future. Don't sleep through it. Or it'll be here different than you planned. This is how the enemy pulls you away from God's purpose. God's purpose is not this majestic thing that falls from heaven. This is how you take God's word and apply it to your life and live out a godly, purposeful life that he intended you to have. And you can have joy in that. It's biblical. Somebody lied to us all and act like you had to be miserable, broke, poor, and the most hateful person to be a good Christian. And last time I checked, that's not the scripture. God wants you to be fruitful and multiply, but not fall asleep because you've disconnected with the root of your tree. What if we could have the mindset of Christ now? that was in the garden. It takes a sacrifice like in the garden in 2024 
to see things like resurrection happen back then in 2024. Can you imagine? Your sacrifice in this moment is what leads to your greatest reward in heaven. You're not looking for the applause of men. You're looking for the praise of the Lord in heaven. That's why you serve God. You don't serve God to impress people with your three-piece suit or your black T-shirt, if you like to preach in black T-shirts. You don't do this to impress people. You do it to please God. That's the reward. This is about sheep and good shepherds. So remember from week one, what the good shepherd does. Just how many remember what the good shepherd does before the sheep? He always goes in front of them, right? So here it is. They didn't stop the betrayers. And what does Jesus do? He offers himself in the moment. Why? He's the good shepherd. The good shepherd will always offer himself for you to have an opportunity to freedom. Despite the apostles falling asleep three times, Jesus knew he would be their ransom and your ransom. Despite how many times you've fallen asleep in your life today in the presence of God's windows and missed it, he still offers himself today as your ransom. Jesus died literally then so you could be captive spiritually today. If you don't want to grasp spiritual death resurrection, spiritual burial death resurrection, you're missing why we do this thing. What you see on the outside is not near as great is what happens in spirit when one comes to the feet of Christ and has a spiritual death, burial, and resurrection. So he died literally then, so you could die spiritually today. And that's still a gift available to you. They were innocent, the apostles. They, they came for Jesus, and Jesus said, no, you're actually... You're guilty by, by the nature of sin is born into you. Well, I'm a good person. Okay, I didn't make the rules. I'm saying everybody's born into humanity. Humanity has fallen by sin. Therefore, if Christ offered you as a ransom, offers himself as a ransom for you in 2024, you need a spiritual death, burial, and resurrection. Y'all can stand this morning. The good shepherd always offers himself. When the wolf comes, the shepherd steps in for you. How cool is that Peter jumped in there with a sword? Mike, I see you jumping in there. If someone messes with me, Mike, you're going to jump in there. If someone messes with KK, you're going to jump in there with the sword. That's why I love Mike. He's my Peter. What does Jesus, the good shepherd, do? Put the ear back. I got this. And that's what's so powerful about Jesus Christ is that he offers himself then and today. Don't sleep through it. The shepherd is always 10 steps ahead of you, so stay in tune. Be aware. He's trying to protect you. He knows what we will need and provides it when you need it, not when you want it. <laughs> when you need it is when he'll provide it. He will sacrifice so even if we fall asleep in the season we're in, we're still safe because they're coming for him in the end. I hope this resonated with someone today. Did it connect with anybody today? Because this is about locking hands with the shepherd. Where he goes, I go. Where he goes, you must go. He's warning them, it's not going to be pretty, Peter. <laughs> you have no idea, Peter, what's coming. 
I don't know if you all know the stories of the apostles and how their lives went, but it's not the Joe Olstein version. It's, and I like Joel, by the way. It's not always pretty, but it's still good. He's warning them, you're going to face something, James, John, Peter. You're going to face something that you're going to remember me saying, don't fall asleep. This is the moment I'm telling you about. You're going to want to say, I'm, I'm too weak for this. You're not too weak for this. You were made for this. But you got to have my spirit to endure it. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray for a moment, shall we? God, thank you for always bringing us back to the center, away from foolishness and back to the ground that is firm. God, we ask that we don't get so caught up in the season we're in, but we remember the reason for this season, and we're not talking about Christmas. That there's a reason that you are testing us, you are trialing us, you ask us to pray not to enter into, it, into this temptation, meaning don't fall to it. Because we know we're going to be tried, we know we're going to be tested, and that's what faith is, but don't fall to it. Help us keep our feet firmly planted on the truth and not the facade of this of the celebrity thing that looks like you but the real thing that is you that is the only thing that will survive and that's what we gotta have to breathe we thank you for that we go out of here stronger than we came in we pray this word landed on fresh hearts we give you thanks right now and we go out in praise and if the house of god could say in jesus name everybody say amen